Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles show that we call Things We Said Today. This is a podcast talk show about the Fab Four in which we discuss anything we feel like, something about their past, maybe something going on in the news, uh, anything in between. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the four regular co-hosts of the show, also known for my weekly Beatles syndicated radio show called Every Little Thing, being joined by my three regular co-hosts. First of all, we have one of the editors for Beatle Fan Magazine, who's actually been with them since the very beginning of the magazine, that being Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. And we also have our resident musicologist, who uh, writes for a number of different publications and also spent many years working for the New York Times for their classical department. And he's also uh, the writer of several Beatle books, that being Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken. Hello, everyone. And also we have the writer for Beatles Examiner, the number one Beatles news source on the Internet, and that's Steve Marinucci. Hello, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. This time out, since it is that time of the year, I thought it might be fun for the four of us to talk about the Beatles' Christmas music and also their messages that they've given us through all these many years. Of course, that means the Christmas messages that they put out through their fan club, and also uh, the songs that we've come to know through all these years as classics, Happy Christmas, Wonderful Christmas Time, Ringo's Christmas Album that he released back in uh, 1999, I believe the year was. So uh, I thought that we'd start by talking about the music, first of all. And uh, there are two songs that I just mentioned there, Happy Christmas, Wonderful Christmas Time, that have become staples on the radio ever since their release. And, um, you know, there's no doubt about it. I think all of us will agree Happy Christmas is uh, an amazing song. To me, it's one of the greatest of all Christmas songs. We're going to talk about each one of them first, but get uh, thoughts from each of you about each of those recordings. Happy Christmas, just to throw out a few thoughts of my own, is not only a great song, but one thing I love most about it is the production. You know, for all that's said about Phil Spector and uh, his use of or what he's... he's uh, Often he's, he's given that title of being the over producer. I think everything about Happy Christmas was perfect in the production. And I think he deserves a lot of credit for that as well. Really a great song and uh, limited use of Yoko, but just the right amount, <laughs> I think, in that song. But uh, really a great song. And of course, the lyrics are pretty incredible. Very unique song for Christmas and what are your thoughts, guys? We'll, t- we'll uh, talk to, uh, let's see, Alan first. Okay. Um, yeah, I like, I like Happy Christmas a lot, but it's also, um, you know, it's also another song. There's, a, there's an old folk song called Stewball, which is pretty uh-huh. much the same melody. And, and John probably would have known Stewball because, it, you know, I think, um, you know, in that, in that period when, you um, you know, early on when they were doing all kinds of uh, skiffle things and stuff like that, I, I'm sure Stubal came up. So whether I, I'd be curious whether he was consciously taking a melody that was basically in the public domain by this point, I'm pretty sure, and repurposing it, or whether it was just one of those things that, uh, like, you know. Uh, as they say, accidental plagiarism um, in the George Harrison case, I think is what, what they finally ruled uh, with my sweet Lord. But yeah, it's kind of, you know, whenever I hear it, I, I, I think of the other song too, uh, which is a very pretty song. Well, obviously it's the same melody, but yeah, I agree with you about the production and um, about uh, whether it's just the right use of Yoko or not. I, I, I don't know about that, um, but I should point out that there is actually a Yoko Christmas record as well, sort of. Um, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the uh, with Flaming Lips. She did a, a track called Atlas Eats Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> and this was only in 2011. So it hasn't yet become a staple, but who knows? Undoubtedly it will. Yeah, I, I, it's, I'm not sure what, what more there's to say about it. I think we should probably also mention the Harlem Boys Choir is on um, Happy Christmas, which was kind of a nice touch. Um, mm. You know, I think it was also, was it around the time they did that? Wasn't it also part of the War is Over? Well, it was part of the War is Over campaign. Mm-hmm. You know, right, it was, right. Seven, it was 71. 
Yeah. So, um, you know, it has that it has that John and Yoko combination piece plus whatever is going on message and whatever was going on was Christmas. So, uh, yeah, nice record. Hmm. You know, uh, speaking of Stewball, that was a record that I grew up on uh-huh. because, um, you know, I was uh, I was used to hearing Peter, Paul and Mary mm, in my, right. in my mm-hmm. household all the time. And their album In the Wind. Right. Uh, was played to death in my household. <laughs> so it's kind of funny that when Happy Christmas came out, I never associated it with Stewball. It's really? only in recent years when I've seen, yeah. Did you think of that, your, you know, all along, Alan? Well, you know, I think when Happy Christmas came out, I probably didn't know Stewball. Um, but huh. later running into it, I, I thought, oh, oh, I see. That's the same song, isn't it? You know. I mean, then hmm. more recently, I've run into it again a lot because of, um, you know, when Pete Seeger died, um, was I ended up writing a bit about that and sort of going through a lot of his recordings. And I think he recorded it, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think I knew it at the time. I knew that there was something vaguely familiar about the tune, but um, I don't think I knew Stewball as, as Stewball. I probably just had heard the tune someplace but didn't know what it was. Yeah. Huh. And incidentally, when you mentioned uh, a Christmas song from Yoko, mm. the flip side of Happy Christmas is That's right. just that. Yeah. Uh-huh. Listen, the snow is falling, which is actually a really nice song. Mm-hmm. Really <laughs> nice melody, too. That's right. Let me just correct one thing that I said as far as the right use of Yoko. I only say that because I know some people find her voice irritating. Right. So I think that for for um, Happy Christmas, it was the right balance so that people who don't really like her voice can tolerate it. Yeah, <laughs> maybe I, okay. that's that's what I really should have said. Yeah. <laughs> Al, how about you? Well, I, I back in the seventies, there was a book that came out, man, and I'm blanking out on who the author was, but it was called "Out of His Head: The Sound of Phil Spector," <laughs> and the <laughs> first chapter was basically about the session for Happy Christmas, and they had gone in, uh, John and Yoko, and, and, you know, and especially bringing Spectre in on this, they wanted to make the ultimate, you know, rock Christmas record, you mm-hmm. know, not unlike the, the album, the classic album that's, that Spectre produced in 1963, A Christmas Gift for You uh, from uh, Phyllis Records. Uh, right. And and so all of the you know all the elements that that Spectre had put into that that original album, he also brought to this to Happy Christmas War is over, and it's just it's a magnificent magnificent record, and I've always hmm. felt I, you know obviously there are, there are a lot of cover versions that have come out in recent years, but I've always felt that they kind of pale in comparison to the uh to the uh, to the original it's just it's a wonderful record and it's one of those that i've uh despite the saturation airplay that it's gotten over the years especially on those you know those 24 7 you know christmas formats unlike probably the next song we're going to be talking about um (laughs) i've never i've never gotten tired of Happy Christmas War is Over. I mean, unfortunately, there are certain times in December where it becomes a little bit of a tough listen emotionally because of its tie to events from later on in December's later on. Let's put it that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but the but the record itself is it's just it's wonderful and for the most part it's one that I've never never tired of. Okay, uh, Steve, your thoughts on Happy Christmas? You know, I, I my if my memory serves me, and at this point in my life, it doesn't always happen. But I don't seem to remember it getting that much love back in when it was first released. Um, Alan, you may be able to remember that too um it took a while i think for this thing to to really catch on and obviously you know john's death helped some or helped boost it a little bit i mean i i think it had it's um you know it's um the 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 popularity of the song has has grown considerably obviously you know over the years and it's really become very traditional now but it seems to me in the beginning and maybe it was because of yoko's 
involvement on the record that it was never it it took a while for it to take off but once it did it, it it's really you know it's really grown as part of the holiday and what's and it, it amazes me and again without referring to the McCartney song just yet how the McCartney song really it really gets played so much more um it it, it uh, you know I don't understand that I really don't but well first of all can I just say you know because I I make it a point this time of year mm -hmm. to turn the radio dial a lot just to see what what Christmas songs get airplay not just uh John songs and Paul songs right so I wouldn't say necessarily Paul's gets played more than John's I mean I hear them pretty much equally what I have noticed and this is just the last couple of weeks, mm -hmm. is that I'm not hearing as much of the rock Christmas songs, the original recordings. I mean, yes, you'll hear Brenda Lee and, and uh, Bobby Helms and, and the real vintage classic ones like that. But the ones in recent years, you know, I'm not hearing the Kinks and I'm not hearing Elton John as much. It, they seem to get less and less airplay. And sometimes you get cover versions of those songs that get airplay. Mm -hmm. I've heard a lot of cover versions of Happy Christmas and yes. Wonderful Christmas Time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I've heard them more than John's recording or Paul's recording. So, and I think one of the things that you have to factor in there, Steve, is what Al just said. It was only in recent years that we suddenly had these all Christmas channels for, uh, you know, a good month to two months before Christmas. Mm -hmm. Right. And when that happens, they have to find material to keep playing over and over and over again. It is a limited use of songs of what right. you can play. So those songs get repeated. But I have noticed, like I said, in the last few weeks, it seems to change. It could change from year to year. You never know. You know, I'm not noticing because I, you know me, Al, from when I was on rock radio. Sure. On WDHA. We used to play the Kinks mm -hmm, all the time sure. and John and certain ones always got Springsteen. They were played over and over and over again. I'm not hearing it as much. You know, when I'm turning the radio dial now, mm -hmm. maybe that's just where, where I'm living. I live in Connecticut, mm -hmm. but I am, I am listening a lot to that. And I really enjoy hearing Christmas music, especially from Thanksgiving on, because it's some of my favorite music. But, um, you know, I'm not, uh, I, I think that there's been a shift. Of course, that all depends on where you're living and what they're playing there. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't say that that Paul song gets more airplay than John's. Hmm. Steve. Okay. Um, let me also just point out for the just for the record that Happy Christmas peaked at number ten here on Billboard and it peaked at number four in the UK. And it was a well, I don't, and, I don't, and it was a year later also. Mm -hmm. Right, it was seventy. It says seventy. The the listing I have here says. Oh wait a minute, no, no, no. It was number. I'm sorry. It was number nine in seventy in December seventy two. You're right. But it also was reissued in seventy five over there and hit number four. Mm. So, so well, I I know the charts here in America, and if you're referring to the Hot 100, Happy Christmas was never on the charts. It was on a Christmas chart, right? And they have separate it, listings right. for that, so that's what you right. mean, yeah, right. But as far as the Hot 100, no, mm -hmm. right, right. Hmm. And and for that matter, Wonderful Christmas Time was never on the Hot 100. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, there you go. I think we have a, an, another slight footnote um, to mention, um, which is a. I think uh, I can't. Remember, I th can't remember which of you mentioned Phil Spector's album. Um, uh, I think it was Al. Me. Uh, okay. That had a brief appearance on Apple Records. Yes, so it did. A, a direct uh, connection to uh, to our thing here <laughs> for Apple Record collectors. Yeah. yeah. You know, you're talking sure. about the Christmas album? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there is actually there is actually a there's a stereo version of that Christmas album that was put out on vinyl. Um, right, but it wasn't on Apple. It was on it was on Warner, another another on label that Spectre had licensed it to. Right, and actually, I and I've been actually listening to that stereo version in the last couple of days. I actually like it. Um, the separation on some of the songs isn't really good, but it's mm. still. I mean, hearing uh, Darlene Love sing "Christmas Baby, Please Come Home" in, in, in separation in both speakers is just fantastic <laughs> that's all i can say yeah all right let's move on to wonderful christmas time and get your thoughts on that particular song once again we'll start with alan uh yeah i'm not really a, 
big fan of Wonderful Christmas Time. You know, the funny thing is that one of the reasons I'm not a big fan of Wonderful Christmas Time is that in some ways it is an absolutely perfect song. It's one of those songs. It was once a Roald Dahl sci- sort of sci-fi story about someone writing a song that was so perfect that once you heard it, you couldn't get it out of your head and it would drive you, drive people crazy. Uh, Wonderful Christmas Time is a little bit like that, you know, and... Um, I've known people who have been so, uh, you know, who it it really becomes an earworm and it drives them crazy and they hear it all day. And if I'm feeling mean, I'll just walk up to them and say, wow, 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 wow. And that's enough. <laughs> that's enough to start it. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know what? It's a it's a nice, cheerful song. I think I think at this point I've got it so that I can hear it without having to hear it the rest of the day in my head. But uh, it's I don't know. It's 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 very lightweight, which I guess a Christmas song can be, which it's intended to be, I suppose. It's just cheerful and bright and, you know, Paul. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure what else I. I can say about it. I, I don't think it's something I would ever voluntarily put on, but if I were to walk into a room and someone was playing it, I wouldn't necessarily walk out. <laughs> Talk about damning with faint praise. <laughs> that really is something. And you know, that brings up a point here. And, and I've heard people say this about a lot of Paul's music. It's not just wonderful Christmas time. Right. They, they hear the song and they dislike the fact that, once they get it in their heads, they can't get it out. Yeah. So whether you're talking about Wonderful Christmas Time or Ebony and Ivory or whatever, you know, these are songs that people like to put down, but yet, you know, they like them and then they resent liking them. Mm. <laughs> so what a horrible position to be put in, you know. <laughs> you know, you don't like a song because you like a song. <laughs> well, it's not quite like that. It's I, I can see how you can put it that way the thing Mm -hmm. is that i think why you resent having it bouncing around in your head all day is because it's basically so trivial you know if you if you had a really great piece of music like you know i don't know a lot of the things he wrote for the beatles bouncing Mm -hmm. around your head all day it wouldn't be the same thing i mean let's say you let's say you had an earworm of hey jude you know okay so what it's hey jude it's great so you're you're thinking about it all day. It's not quite as irritating as like simply having wonderful Christmas time all day long. Well, I don't find that irritating, Alan. <laughs> I Sorry. Know. I know you don't. I like I like catchy, bouncy songs like that. And you know, the thing I love about Wonderful Christmas Time is the mood that it sets you in. You know, it's happy, it's festive, mm-hmm. it says everything you want to say. It's about having a good time at Christmas. Mm-hmm. And and like uh, we discussed this earlier, I love the fact that, and I don't make the comparison between that and Happy Christmas, I love the fact that they're so opposite. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what made the Beatles so great, was the contrast between John and Paul there. So, um, you know, why have two songs that sound identical or have the same mood to them? Okay. You know, as soon as you hear the, the opening of Wonderful Christmas Time, you know you're going to be in a good mood. <laughs> you know, so just l- listen to the words. So lift the glass. Don't look down. <laughs> you know, that's what it's all about. That's what Christmas time is about. Being with your family, being with your friends, having fun. Mm. So there you go. There's my two cents. Okay. Al, how about you? Well, it's, you know, it's interesting that uh, despite the fact that the song was recorded, you know, some 36 years ago, it see, it's almost as if it was tailor made for these, again, these 24 7. Christmas formats, and I think that may be one of the reasons why it gets such saturation airplay in those formats because it fits it perfectly. And mm-hmm. you know, it's uh, uh, you know, it's it's a nice little pop record. But um, I mean, just personally, I mean, as big a Paul McCartney fan as I am, if I never hear "Wonderful Christmas Time" again for the rest of my life, I won't miss it. But, you know, as as big a Bruce Springsteen fan as I am, if I never hear Santa Claus is coming to town again, I won't miss it. And yet Happy Christmas War is over, which gets almost as much airplay. I've never gotten tired of it. 
So mm. I don't, you know, I guess maybe that's just me. But it, uh, but you know, I, you know, give sort of give the you know the devil's advocate. It uh, uh, as I said, it's it's really tailor made for these kind of Christmas formats. You know, it's, you know, uh, right in there with more contemporary recordings. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I would just like to add, and this is just a credo that I live by mm-hmm. here. I never let what radio has done to a record affect my judgment of it. You know, even if it's a song that I'm completely burnt out on, I may not want to hear the song, but I'll still think highly of the song. And so, you know, I can remember going back to uh, when Stairway to Heaven was played to death on the radio. Mm -hmm. Two years after it came out, it was like, as soon as I hear the beginning of that song, I don't want to hear it again, ever. (laughs) But I will never deny that that's a great song. Mm -hmm. So I will not let what radio does and the saturation of certain songs affect how I think about certain songs. It just so happens, Wonderful Christmas Time, I can hear that song every single day during Christmas season and never get tired of it. I love it. I love it to death. Anyway, Mm -hmm. Steve, I'm sure that you have a different opinion. What makes you say that? Um, No, (laughs) I don't know. Actually, actually, I am very thankful that Wonderful Christmas Time isn't Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reggae. So, <laughs> because I can't stand that song, I really hate it, and uh, I can listen to Wonderful Christmas Time a lot more than I can listen to Rudolph. So uh-huh. that's okay. that's basically all I have to say. I mean, there's really not much, not much else to say. I mean, it's not a, it's not an offensive song. It's not a bad song. It's a typical McCartney song. I I just want to know, Ken, if he decides to remaster it and put out outtakes, are you going to buy it? Sure. <laughs> well, I mean, the sad thing is, I if buy. He decides to put out remaster it and put out outtakes. I'm gonna buy. Mm. <laughs> then what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a different issue. I know, I know. But anyway, he, he could there, do it just to be mean, specifically to me. <laughs> that's, that's he could. He could. If I ever get to talk to him about, it, I'll ask him to do that just for you, Alan. <laughs> And have him do uh, disco versions of the song, too. Absolutely, yeah. There we go. All right, let's move on to an album called I Want to Be Santa Claus. And this is actually the only time when one of the Beatles released a Christmas album, well, legally, we should say. Mm -hmm. Uh, So um, it came out, I believe, in 1999. Mm -hmm. I'm doing this from memory. But um, it's an album that I treasure. And uh, that because, first of all, I love the format of it. It's half uh, original songs that Ringo wrote with uh, Mark Hudson and the studio band The Roundheads. Uh, All new songs that really fit Ringo vocally and melodically, and they sound like Ringo songs. Mm -hmm. And um, the other songs are, you know, more traditional Christmas songs or rock songs, you know, Winter Wonderland and... And doing Little Drummer Boy, which was a natural mm-hmm. for Ringo to pick that one. White Christmas, Blue Christmas. Um, it's a real treat. And just just as someone who's been doing uh, radio shows on the Beatles all these years, it is nice to have something else to play. <laughs> <laughs> Besides Happy Christmas and Wonderful Christmas Time and the Beatles Christmas Messages. So um, what are your thoughts, guys, on uh, on Ringo's christmas album i want to be santa claus once again we'll start with alan okay i love i want to be santa claus i have to say um when it came out i thought oh really a christmas record but you know it rocks it's um Mm. you know it's it starts off out with um come on christmas christmas come on which actually to me sounds sort of like it's a a page from john's playbook you know Mm. um it's kind of like instant karma yeah i think and also the me. the end, um, Pax Umbiscum, uh, with uh, the you know he's got the sitars going there. But otherwise, apart from the sitars, that sounds sort of like a John Lennon White Album era track too, or somewhere between "I'm the Walrus" and the White Album. So, but otherwise, you know, um, I don't even. I, I don't even think besides that I would say it's even too beatly as such. It's it's maybe a little bit more in the tradition of the Phil Spector Christmas album, but it it's very driven. He's very lively. It's uh, you know, when we've talked about his 
his um, singing in the past when we were, I think we were talking about his new album. And I said that there was, you know, just that quality of Ringo ness or whatever, you know, just something about it's, it's not like he's one of the world's great singers, but there's something in the personality of his voice that's all over this thing too. And uh, I don't know. It's just a lot of fun. Um, listen to it this afternoon and, uh, and, and really sort of enjoyed it uh, as as I have whenever I've played it, which isn't that frequently, I have to say. But um, I uh, I thought it was a, a good job, you know, as a Christmas album goes. So mm-hmm. yeah, so there we go. What what did you think of the original songs on there? Um, I thought they were actually pretty good. Um, I kind of don't know if they necessarily stand up to the non original songs. But, you know, they're, well, they're in the same spirit, you know, they're sort of hard driven and um, energetic. And I also think he does a a reasonably good job of Christmas Time is Here Again, which, uh, you know, it's the only other, I, I would say it's. He he made it into more of a full song than the Beatles had. I mean, the, for the for the Beatles version, it really is just sort of a chorus that goes on for six or seven minutes. Mm, um, right. He, he had different things coming in and out that uh, you know that kind of rounded it out a bit. I thought he did a great job with Blue Christmas. You know, it's sort of a I associate that with Elvis and. Um, even, uh, you know, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. I mean, all that stuff, and, and not to mention, like you said, Little Drummer Boy, uh, that obviously was a natural. But I think I think what I like about those songs on this record is that he really found an original way to do them that kind of made them his, you know. So I think it's it's just a, a really good Christmas record. You know, I've been listening to a lot of Christmas records lately, or at least sampling a lot of Christmas records, just because I'm kind of fascinated by the whole phenomenon, um, not being fundamentally a Christmas guy, you know. Um, mm. But, you know, so many groups and jazz people and everyone else have made them um, – and I was just listening to a bit of the Supremes one, uh, which was from 1965, and wasn't really knocked out by it. I mean, I kind of expected to like it a lot more than I did because I like the Supremes. But I think Ringo's is really up there uh, as as those things go. So okay, yeah. Well, I want to I want to just ask you a question, Alan, and then Al, you can even bounce off mm-hmm. this. But when you were talking about the the cover versions that are on this album, we're talking Little Drummer Boy, mm-hmm. Winter Wonderland, Blue Christmas, White Christmas. Um, were they the way that you envisioned Ringo would have done it anyway, or did you think that that he really took it to a, a, a different a different arrangement? Yeah, I thought he or, took it to something new. I, I I would never have guessed how he would have done these really. I, I really had, you know, when I looked at the track list when I first got it, I, I had no preconceptions at all. I mean, I, I they could have been anything. He could have crooned them, you know. He could have crooned White Christmas. He could sure. have done that in the in the form of, you know, Sentimental Journey. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, you know, he could have done a lot of things, and um, and I, I'm I'm just happy that he did it the way he did it, you know, as a rock record, or really a rock record. Yeah. So no, it, it wasn't what I would have expected him to do i don't know what i would have expected him to do though i i I didn't really have any preconceptions yeah okay how about you al your thoughts on the album yeah i think in you know in his in his production uh mark hudson went to great lengths so that if especially those you know those old chestnuts wouldn't be done you know pretty much in the same way that that so many uh, so many artists do them that uh, to you know kind of take them in different in different directions um mm-hmm. uh the as for the you know the rest of the album it, i mean it's a, it's a it's a it's a you know a lovely little album it's uh uh you know as a as a christmas record it's a nice it's a nice listen uh i think the because of the fact that there's such chestnuts that the you know the the non originals the covers, if you will, you know, kind of overshadow the originals on the album. But the uh, but it's you know it, it all it all falls together very nicely. And uh, and and yeah, I think Alan has a good point that uh, that that maybe Mark 
Mark Hudson uh, put in a little, you know, a little dash of specter, mm-hmm. uh, you know, whereas it's, you know, it's not as Beatles kind of uh, leaning as some of the, you know, the, the uh, you know, Ringo Rama and albums like that, that, that Hudson produced uh, for Ringo. But uh, it's uh, yeah, it's a it's a it's a nice uh, it's a nice addition to the you know the rock uh, the rock Christmas music canon definitely. So you think that the covers overshadow the originals? Because I well, love they the originals. Always, I mean, they always they always will because those songs are just so you know. Again, those are the songs that uh, other than Wonderful Christmas Time. <laughs> And other things. Those are the songs that you hear. The songs, not not Ringo's versions, because they they never get played anywhere, uh, you know, other than Beatles programs. But uh, those songs are, you know, those are the staples of those uh, of those twenty four seven Christmas uh, Christmas formats to a great extent, you know, because mm. those are the Christmas you know the Christmas classics. So it's almost unavoidable. That they're going to overshadow the original songs. Yeah, there have been times when I've heard the title track "I Want to Be Santa Claus" usually in a supermarket mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. when it's close to Christmas time, mm-hmm. but but never on the radio. Right. I never hear it yeah. L- unless, like you said, it's a Beatles show. Right, exactly. Because there are a lot of a lot of the supermarkets now use these digital services, right? And a lot of them now have several different channels of Christmas songs. Some of them are the traditional mm. Christmas songs. Some of them are, you know, the rap versions of Christmas songs. Uh, and, and then there are also, you know, rock and roll Christmas channels. So, mm. and it's probably on those that you would hear something like, you know, like Christmas time is here again, or come on Christmas or right. want to be Santa Claus. Okay. Steve, your thoughts on Ringo's Christmas album? Well, you know, I think when I think, uh, and I'm not necessarily speaking for myself, but I think a lot of people when they heard or they saw this album originally, they probably figured, "Oh boy, Ringo has done a Christmas album, big deal." And I think to do that and dismiss it like that, they would be very disapp- they would be disappointed because although I don't think it's perfect all the way through i think it does have some great stuff on it i love the opening track i love i want to be santa claus and i really was i was listening to it recently and i was really taken by little drummer boy with the choir that's very cool so i think i you know there's a i think people who uh, you know people should give this a chance because it's much better and and what's really nice about it is he he um he put his personality into it. You know, it's not just a, it's not just a, a, a mail in thing at all. And that's, an, that's, you know, looking at the track list, especially with the cover songs, you would think that he just mailed it in and he really didn't. And then they did a, they did a great job with it. So, uh, you know, on that note, I think it, it definitely deserves some respect. I noticed we didn't mention George, the George Harrison, ding dong, ding dong. Uh, I know. I was going to get to that. Oh, okay. Okay. That. Okay. Because <laughs> you didn't mention Harrison at all, and I was going to say, um, even though it isn't technically a Christmas song, it does have some Christmas elements to it. So, all right, never mind. Okay, I just wanted to finish up on Ringo's album because the original songs to me are the are more of the highlights. I'm just very impressed with um, a song like Christmas Eve. Yeah. If you listen to that song, it is absolutely gorgeous. And it reminds me in, in many ways of Remember mm. from Harry Nilsson. Mm. If you do listen to that song melodically, and it's a little bit haunting and it's got that Ringo quality, that, that real gentle voice kind of like in Good Night. And it's really nice. Uh, everything, the whole production behind that. If that song was released at a time as a single when Ringo was having hits, that might be, you know, a staple. Mm-hmm. As far as, uh, you know, Christmas songs are concerned, I Want to Be Santa Claus also has a very Nilsson-esque, you know, mm-hmm. quality to yeah. it. Right. And Come on Christmas is, is a great opening number. Right. It really is. It just, it just kickstarts the whole album. Mm-hmm. So um, Christmas Dance has a, a, a nice 1965 Beatles, what would it be compared to? Not like Honey Don't or What Goes On. <laughs> I don't know that kind of a feel to it, at least for me, anyway. But uh, and then that sort of know, ballroom it's... ending. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, you know, now that you uh, mention it, Ken, I mean, I, I, I guess one thing that I thought of about the originals, too, is that it takes a certain amount of um, chutzpah <laughs> to, yeah. to be able, you know, to sit down and say, OK, we're going to we're going to write new Christmas songs to stand as- alongside Little Drummer Boy and White Christmas and 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 all of that. And I think, you know, I I, I was listening when I was listening to the originals, I thought, you know, it, it must be really actually tough to figure out what you know, what do you do? What do you come up with? And I thought Christmas mm-hmm. dance was very inventive. I thought I want to be Santa Claus's, you know, really kind of, you know, that Ringo public persona, you know, mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, now that you mention it, it's 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 funny. I, I I agree with Al that that the standards are the ones that really are going to overshadow. But but the effort that went into the originals too is is uh, is really something to think about. Right. Yeah. If anything, the only weak spot for me is Christmas time is here again. Really. You know, because mm. yeah, I mean, it's nice that he's doing it because the Beatles did it. Yeah. But you know, kind of like you said, Alan, and I've said this, you know many times it's just a chorus yeah. mm-hmm. repeated over and over and over again there's not much to the song other than the fact that you know the beatles did it yeah so it might have just been something to please mark hudson that ringo did this mm-hmm. but uh you know the rest of the album i think is just it's killer i think it really and who would have thought that ringo's actually written more christmas songs than john or paul yeah <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, before we talk about Ding Dong Ding Dong, I forgot about another McCartney song because he did cover the Christmas song. Yes. Right. And um, he did that. It was on an album called Holidays Rule, which was a a compilation that Concord Music put Mm -hmm. out back in uh, 2012. So um, what did you guys think of that version of the Christmas song? Alan? Um, you know, it was nice. It was in the in the spirit of the what I guess are the sessions that came out of um, Kisses on the Bottom. Um, right. Uh, and I believe it was a bonus track on the expanded version of that. And if I remember correctly, the bonus track version was a little bit different than the Concord compilation version. I can't mm-hmm. remember quite what the differences were, but uh, I, I I remember, OK, got to keep them both. <laughs> Yeah, the introduction was different. Yeah, I think he did. You know, I, he did. He did a nice job, but he, but he did exactly the opposite of what we were all talking about. Ringo doing. You know, he, he, mm-hmm. he did it pretty much the way you would expect him to do it. You know, um, and I think probably the best you can say for that is that you know he did it you know, with a certain amount of respect for the Nat King Cole version and, and the, the tradition mm. of that song. And, uh, and it's a song also, I, I don't know if you could really rock it up. I suppose you could, but, but that's not the spirit of the song really. Um, mm. so yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a perfectly nice version. It's, uh, I'd rather hear that than wonderful Christmas time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> is, is everything going to be, uh... but, yeah. Um, <laughs> And also, I probably should say that, you know, I wish Ringo had included a Hanukkah song on his album. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, for Brian's sake or Barbara's sake or Linda's right. sake or, right. or you know, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of Jewish people in this story. Sure. So, um, and there are many of them in the Beatles story. There right. certainly are. And Nancy. Mm. So. Right. Yes. There you go. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so none of them have done a Hanukkah song. So uh, there there are still horizons to be opened. <laughs> I want to hear a good version of Ma'otsur. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Al, how about you, the Christmas song? What did you think? It's it's very nice. It's, you know, uh, as Alan said, it comes from the sessions for Kisses on the Bottom, which were recorded in the Capitol Record Studios and using the microphone that Nat King Cole used to record many of his uh, his songs for Capitol. And so I think I'm sure that Paul was conscious of that when he recorded the Christmas song, because mm. you can tell that his, you know, that his vocal is very faithful to the, to the Nat King Cole version. Um, you know, right. as, as Alan said, you can't really rock that song up too much. But it, uh, mm-hmm. but I think he, you know, did a nice, 
did a, a nice traditional treatment of it. Okay. Actually, what I had heard about his recording of it, it wasn't exactly from the Kisses on the Bottom sessions. It was a few months after, and he recorded it in New York, oh, really? oh. actually, in, in Avatar Studios. But he used some of the same musicians. Diana Krall's on there. Okay. John Pizzarelli's on there. So some of the same people that were on Kisses on the Bottom. Uh, Steve, how about you? You know, uh, uh, my feelings about the album have pretty much... I mean, I, I don't really care that much for the album now, I have to admit. But I think of all the songs, if there's maybe one or two songs that stand, that, you know, stand, have stand, stood the test of time, that's probably one of them. Because it's so natural for that you know, for that format, for that, for what he was trying to do there. Some of those other mm -hmm. songs, I don't think, you know, and and I don't want to get into a, I'm not trying to get into a discussion on Kisses, but some of the other songs just didn't work the way he was trying to make them work. And, but that one does because that's what it is. And so, you know, in that respect, I think it, it you know, it's a good, it's a good job. So. Okay. We weren't really talking about kisses on the bottom. No, but, I know, you know. but I'm, but, uh, <laughs> but I was comparing because I mean it was, yeah. it was in that. I mean, it was part of that situation, so that's why I'm mentioning that. But yeah, I, I mean, as far as the song itself goes, I think uh, it's it's pretty good. Mm. Yeah, I like it a lot. I mean, it's something that would have fit naturally right on that album anyway. Mm -hmm. It's the same style, the same delivery. It's just um, you know. Well done. <laughs> I'd like to hear, you know, I, I, I'm craving to hear more Christmas music from Paul McCartney. I wish he would do more of it. Or a Hanukkah song, like Alan yeah. suggested. <laughs> All right. So since you mentioned it, Steve, and I was going to say it anyway, what about Ding Dong, Ding Dong? It's not technically a Christmas song. It's really a, a New Year's Eve song, right. really. Right. Um, but it, it's a song that um, I rock in the New Year with at 12 midnight. That's my old Lang Syne. Is that your old Lang Syne? I love that. <laughs> it is. I really, really, really love that song a lot. I always have. Um, just the, just the the playfulness and the spirit and the fun and it's just a, it's just a great song. I mean, I don't know if it's because it reminds me somewhat of Phil Spector, a little bit. It reminds me of Tracy Ullman a little bit. Uh, they don't know. How does how does that remind you? That reminds the, you of they the, don't know the bells. The bells. Um, because I love okay. Tracy, that Tracy Ullman song is like on my top 10 mm -hmm. of all time. I, I absolutely adore that song. Um, and I always think of the video version, too, um, mm -hmm. because of that. Of course. Uh, but but anyway. Um, Whenever I think of that song, I think of like Leslie Gore, just, you know, or someone song. from the 60s. Mm -hmm. You know, it's got that feel to it, that mid 60s feel. Right. So there you go. I mean, I, I, there's not really too too much to say as far as I'm concerned you know, to analyze it. It's just, it's just a, a fun song. It's a great song. I wish he had done a, a real, a couple of real Christmas songs. Um, I'm sorry. You know, that would have been, I can imagine what he would have done, but uh, I'll take this. Okay. How about you guys? Al, we'll start with you. Not, I can't really say too much more than what Steve said. It's just, it's a, it is a, a fine, fine kind of celebratory record. And, and and there is, you know, the, the, the production is kind of uh, reminiscent of Spectre's of Spectre's work, uh, Spectre's especially his Christmas his Christmas work. Uh, mm. It's uh, yeah, it's just a, a fun, very optimistic song, you know, perfect, perfect for, you know, New Year's, mm -hmm. you know. And there aren't many. There aren't no, many New Year's true. Eve songs. Mm -hmm. That's so, true. So for everyone listening, you can corner the market right now with New Year's Eve songs and more Hanukkah songs. Right. <laughs> we, well, actually, we, I mean, we, we can, can we could start to we could start to get into have, uh, to New Year's song Happy New Year by ABBA. There's one. And then there's your favorite one, Steve. What? Uh oh. It's just another New Year's Eve from your favorite artist, Barry Manilow. Oh God. You were, you were raving about. That's right. With your Dave Morell interview. <laughs> anyway, we won't get into that. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Okay. I didn't think we'd mentioned Barry Manilow twice on the show, on the show, but okay. <laughs> you might hear it more often than you yeah. think. Uh -uh. Alan, especially in a show where we're you? already talking about wonderful Christmas time, you might as well mention it. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. And very and very proudly, Alan, 
you. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I mean, I, there's not much more to say than what Steve and Al said. Um, it's exactly as they described it, and Steve mentioned the video, and I, I always think of the video, too, and I think the video gives it an extra little component. I mean, apart from being cheerful and optimistic and forward-looking and a great New Year's song, the video gives it that touch of sort of zany humor that that George had, you know, in in a lot of cases. And I think that, um, and and I think for me, that's part of the song too. It's it's just a little bit, a little bit out there in the, the zany meter. So yeah, it's it's a it's a great song, and as as you say, there aren't that many New Year songs. Uh, um, for repurposing Beatles related things for New Year songs, you know, as I'm I'm sure pretty much everybody knows uh, when they drop the ball in Times Square, it always is Imagine now. Yes, that's true. For for how long? Maybe like ten years or more. Or more, yeah. Yeah. So hmm. so there's a, yet another Beatles New Year's connection. Okay. Yeah, I think Ding Dong Ding Dong is a great New Year's Eve song. You know, the the problem with that is it's that it's so connected with one day of the year. Yeah. So you're not gonna get airplay for that very same reason. And the best thing about it is it's it's chant like. You know, it's ring out the old, ring in the new. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very easy lyrics to repeat over and over and over again. So uh it works on that level. It's catchy as hell. Like wonderful Christmas time is. So uh, you know, I think that uh, you know, it's it's Great for its purpose, and I wish more people would be familiar with it outside of Beatle fans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's talk about the Beatles' Christmas messages, which they put out through their fan club from 1963 through 69. Well, actually, and... connected, connected to that is the one release of a Beatles Christmas song, right? You mean like Christmas Time is Here exactly. Again? Exactly. Okay, well, a bit of which you we call got, it a song. A bit of which we got on the, uh, what, Back of Free as a Bird, was it? Yes. Yeah. Mm. Okay. But, um, you know, these were something special that the Beatles made for their fans. Yeah. And it's something really unique and a great part of their history. And it's always fun to hear it on the radio when they do play it. There's so many things I'd love to say about it, but just a few quick comments that shows their wacky sense of humor, mm -hmm. which you wouldn't get on most of their records outside of, you know, my name, <laughs> uh, you know, that kind of thing. We talked about this earlier. And I love when they when they did, especially the 66 one, which is my favorite, where they have all these snippets of songs that they throw in, which they did also in, in 67 with Christmas Time is Here Again. But, you know, uh, I love all the songs that they throw in and all the sketches, the pantomime. Uh, that took a lot of work. It took more thought mm -hmm. to do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, my only regret is, and I've said this before, I wish the Beatles had just done one complete Christmas song because you listen to all these these snippets, which are great in the format that they're using it with. You know, something like um, the banjo song or um, Everywhere It's Christmas. Those are great little short songs that work when you mix it with sketches. You know, I wish that they developed some of these songs further if they would have worked as full songs. And I've never looked at Christmas Time is Here Again as a full song. It's a great hook. It's a great chorus. There ain't much more to it other than the fact that it's the Beatles and it's their harmonies and that's what makes that work. But um, they're all special and they mirror the times, each one that came out. So that's what makes those special for me. How about for the rest of you? We'll start again with Alan. Okay. Um... You know, I, I always kind of like Christmas Time is here again, even though there isn't much to it. Um, you know, presumably they recorded the long version of the track specifically to be cut up for the sketches. And with the sketches around it, it really works great. And the same really for Everywhere It's Christmas. Um, I think once they got into doing the sketches, that was a lot more in... I mean, that showed them just as they were doing with their albums, you know, it's like, let's do something other than what will be expected. So for, you know, 63, 64, and largely the 65 one, you just have them thanking people for basically being fans, seeing the films, buying the books, all you know, and, and it's mm -hmm. great hearing them do that. They do it in a really amusing way. The interplay between them is great. It's like all the stuff that we wanted to hear, you know, as fans, Back then, you know, just a few minutes of them 
just talking and messing about, even though it was scripted, you know, those were fine. But then, you know, once they started coming up with more inventive ways to do it, I mean, I guess they must have felt, you know, by 66, you know, what do we can't we can't just go and thank everybody for all of this again. Plus, we can't thank them for coming out to see us in the tours because the touring was now such a horrible experience for them. They probably didn't mm. want to even discuss it. And, um, you know, so doing something else, making it making it into a composition fundamentally, you know, not necessarily a full musical composition, but a, a little play. And then towards the end, we I think we've all discussed this a little in email, the 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 fact that the last two were so fragmented and recorded separately and mm -hmm. stitched mm -hmm. together, um, I guess, by Kenny Everett, which gave them a special quality, too. I like the individual contributions, you know, I mean, where do you get to hear Tiny Tim sing Nowhere Man? <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. I love that. Love yeah. So, um, you know, I mean, those are those are maybe not as much fun as the ones where they're all in a room, but um, but they had a lot going for them. You know, John's little sort of, you know, Jock and Yono poetry pieces. And uh, yeah, I, I I like also the idea. I mean, I think that unlike every other group around that was recording a Christmas album that was a Christmas album, they wanted to do something else. And I, I kind of like that. I mean, I'm not sure what a Beatles Christmas album would be. I'm sure it would be great. But, you know, everybody was doing them, the Beach Boys, the Supremes, you name it. And it just doesn't seem like something they would do. So I think this is a what the little messages they did were sort of a great uh, little bonbon bon for the end of the year. And then when they were breaking up and Apple put them all onto one LP, even though it was a promo only LP, I thought that worked out pretty nicely too. I wish they would release it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, publicly. Amen. Yeah. That's interesting what you said there, Alan. I mean, I, I couldn't have seen the Beatles make a proper Beatles Christmas album, but it would have been nice just to get one song. Mm -hmm. You know, one song that you would hear every single year on these Christmas stations, you know, the one Beatles song. Yeah. But uh, I just wish yeah. they had done a little something a little more with Christmas Time is here again to make it into a complete song. That would have been the one because because I like the bit that they did. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Al, mm. how about you? Uh, just to you know, kind of expand on, on what you were just saying uh, and what Alan mentioned, actually, when you think about it. There really were no other than the, the the Beach Boys, and half of that album is simply a uh, you know a kind of a, a traditional pop Christmas album, uh, and one side of it is more Brian Wilson produced Beach Boys music. Other than that, there really weren't any other contemporary groups. Oh yeah, yeah, there were. Yeah, there were. Al. Yeah, there were. Um, here, they, were making, the they were making Christmas albums at that time in the oh. mid '60s because the yes. because that Supremes album is really just kind of like a you know uh, you know assembly line Motown album you know no it's no different than the Supremes at the Copa uh, just as mm -hmm. Christmas songs. Oh yeah. no 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 go go hunt go hunt number one for the Paul number one is uh, Paul Revere and the Raiders who did this very untraditional Christmas album. But the one that I was really going to mention was the Four of Seasons. That's the one. That is, that is like Jersey Boys. It's yes. Beautiful. Okay. It's yeah. Beautiful. Okay. Uh, I'll consider myself corrected yeah, on that. I mean, there, uh, I, think, I think there are actually a few others too, but those two come to mind. The Four Seasons especially is fantastic. Right. But the, like, mm. they're really, they're contemporaries, the Stones. The right. Food. Right. Groups, can you imagine the birds? You know, <laughs> yeah. We're, can you we're imagine not recording? The, we're not recording the Christmas, who Christmas we're not album. recording Christmas <laughs> albums. You know, so it, it would have, uh, you know, it, it would have been very strange uh, for there to be a, you know, it would have been unique for there to be a Beatles Christmas album or even a Beatles Christmas single at that uh, at that time. But uh, you know, but they didn't. But the 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 messages. Is kind of like a uh, almost like a mini history of the group, 
Mm-hmm. You know, the first, mm-hmm. the first, two, mm-hmm. the first two are the four Jolly Mop Tops. Mm-hmm. You know, the third one, the '65 one, is the the four Jolly Mop Tops on pot. You know, and <laughs> <laughs> right. And, you know, and then as their, you know, as their music was becoming more, uh, more complex and diversified, they then went back, took their influences, you know, their goon show influences, the English satire of that time, uh, that, that influence and all, and put those influences into the 66 and 67 uh, uh, messages or records, if you will, and and then sixty eight, obviously sixty eight and sixty nine uh, are obviously reflective of the you know the splintering of the of the group. You know the fact that you know the sixty eight one comes after you know what they've acknowledged in in the years since was the f- the first real tension filled album. You know, right. the White Album, and so you, you have, um, you know, you have, you know, you have John's, um, you know, pretty direct zingers uh, in the in all the the Jock and Yono stuff, and you have Paul's uh, solo piece, which obviously was, you know, was done probably at his home studio or where, wherever. And, uh, you know, and uh, and George in L.A. with Tiny Tim and Ringo, again, just sort of almost literally phoning in his portion. And 69 is just is is really in retrospect is very sad, actually, because Mm -hmm. you can see how splintered they had become Mm -hmm. because because Mm -hmm. the the that the 69 message is very dominated by John and Yoko. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, it really just, you know, just one, one or two little drop ins by George and Ringo and another little song that uh, that recorded that Paul probably recorded on the farm, you know, in Scotland. And um, the rest of it was John and Yoko. And it's uh, it, it has kind of a melancholy feel to it. You know, so you can just you can just sense less effort being yes, put into it. Yes, very much so. Mm-hmm. Very much so. But yeah. uh, uh, but it is good that they that in in seventy that the that Apple decided to put them all together onto a you know onto especially since a lot of those uh, you know the messages themselves were uh, you know were not on uh, you know very good quality uh, material. So they were very tough to play. So to have them on a, on a, a you know, on an LP was, was, you know, a nice, a very nice touch. And, it, and, and yeah, why, you know, why they haven't released it, I have no idea. Because, I mean, it's not as if they have to come up with a cover. You know, they already have it. So, you know, why not just, you know, just put it out. You know, I can't see, you know, why there should be any objection by any of the four directors, but who knows? Yeah. Does anyone know all those those short songs that we were talking about, you know, Everywhere It's Christmas mm-hmm. and the banjo song, whatever that title is, were those songs all copywritten? I mean, they could have just been something that they, they, throw, they threw together for this and didn't bother to, to have published. I mean, there's probably you have to do a little bit of work for that if it if it needs to be published. I would have think they would have had to to put them out publicly on the flexies. I would, I, I, but it wasn't a com- it wasn't a commercial release, right? But yeah, but they legal, have people to so, do the work for them, so it doesn't really right. But legal the reason. the the only reason I can think of is why they might not have put it out in 1970 when that you know when they compiled that LP is maybe they maybe they felt that wait a minute these were things that we gave away free to the fan club if we now sell it it will seem unseemly mm. but at this point you know all the years have gone by and um, you know I, I yeah they ought to I can't think they, why they, they haven't they did put um, some of it on the on Rock Band remember. So, and you, I mean, you paid for it then. So, I mean, you've already got a precedent for doing that. But I agree. I I think this is something historically 
it deserves to be out. Um, and 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 I mean, I love the the mop top part of it. I think the you know the first couple are are fun. You know, I mean, you could listen to those over and over again. And I agree with Al completely about the about the splintering as it goes on. But mm. but Al Alan's point about the Beatles never making a Christmas album. I think if the Beatles, I think that was the whole point behind the Fab Four's hark to create something that would have would have been what they might have done had they done it and i think you can i think you know i i think you can say that it's probably good that they that, that, that number one that they didn't go through and do the typical um thank you thank you thank you every year okay so mm. that makes makes them kind of distinctive for that but also it's probably good that they didn't do what the fab 4 did even though that that's a fun album to listen to for anybody that ha- that hasn't heard, there are so there are actually a couple albums that borrow the Beatles style that try to create you know to take uh, Christmas carols and and do something with them. The Fab Four's Hark, which was originally issued as two separate CDs, but it's now been combined as one, is really well worth having and well worth getting. It's on Amazon and it should be, you should be able to find it in your local store, but it's great. It's really, really fun to listen to. Mm. You can just, I mean, they, they, they managed to take little, you know, count ins and everything like that from the, from the Beatles, uh, you know, the Beatles studio takes, I, I don't know how they avoided a, a lawsuit on that thing. I mean, really that, you know, but uh, there's, it's, it, it's a lot of fun. It really is. It's actually it's actually brilliant what they did because, mm-hmm. you know, just to be able to use Beatles songs and their arrangements and whether it's just the way that the guitars are played in a certain song, mm-hmm. like uh, setting uh, Rudolph the Rendo's Reindeer in the style of I Saw Her Standing There or something like that. Or they, they did Felice Navidad in the style mm-hmm. of And I Love Her. Mm-hmm. You know, it's really having the mind to work the songs together. That really, you know, that takes a lot of talent. And they also sound very much like them vocally. Right. I'm trying to think which which is the one. There's one that starts off just like Mr. Moonlight, and the guy who who sings lead sounds just like John. And you, and you <laughs> know, I've, I've heard people say they've heard the they've heard the CD and they actually think it's the Beatles. There are people who who can't tell the difference. I mean, mo- I'm you know we we can, and I'm you know I'm sure most of our listeners can, but there are yeah I mean there are people that. And listen to that thing and and don't know that it's not them and that's that's you know that means they've done a good job to do that there was another uh similar album and i think ken knows this one that came out actually before a few years before the fab four uh released theirs um an album called beatmus yeah. mm-hmm. yes. Really? yes yeah yeah yes. that's right too yeah. i have i do i have that one too and, and that's a good one and there's another one called. Uh, there's another one that's come out since called. I think it's called Abbey Road Christmas, that is not as good. It's definitely not as good. Um, but Beatmas actually is really good, and I think you can find it if you hunt for it. But I think it's also out of print. So, but in any event, hmm. I would definitely definitely investigate those CDs, especially the Fab Four, because it was just so well executed mm-hmm. what they did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I also echo those same words that you said, Steve. Those early Beatles Christmas messages are really special in in, in its own way because you can tell they were young then. Mm-hmm. They were excited about what was to happen. Sure. You think about recording the 63 message and, you know, <laughs> they didn't know it was about to happen mm-hmm. the next year. Right. You know, world world domination right right before them. Um, but they were excited just from everything that happened in England, yeah. you know, the success of, uh, please, please me, you know, and, and, uh, their singles that year and just talking about it, you can, you can hear the excitement in them, you know, and, um, same thing in 64 and to a lesser degree 65, but you really got their sense of humor. Mm-hmm. Um, some of that stuff was ad libbed. A lot of, I think most of it was scripted. Didn't Tony Barrow write the scripts on I the, the he, early? Mm, yeah. Christmas messages, yeah, but you can even tell sometimes, especially with John. John would go off on his own, right, and ad lib something. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, those are a lot of fun. But like, like we've all been saying, they all kind of mirrored the years mm-hmm. that they represented. So they're fascinating, and just like what you said, Steve, it is a part of history, mm-hmm. and um, it should come out legally 
for that very reason. The same, the same reason why the Beatles videos just came out. Mm-hmm. Right. That's an important part of their history. It shouldn't have taken so many years for it to come out legally like this. So, um, you know, the fact that they did this for the fans and it was such a unique thing to do for the fans is one of the many reasons why we appreciate this band and and our appreciation grows more and more mm-hmm. all the time. One, oh, one, so, one, uh, one more one more Christmas album. I just I just thought of that's worth uh, looking for if you don't uh, have it is the James Brown. James Brown did Christmas songs and they are amazing. But I don't have to I mean and they're from that period too. So when he was uh when he was really fantastic, uh, some of those songs are just tremendous. But anyway, that's I don't. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that's uh, um, there are um, there are a couple. The Four Seasons one though is really the one to to look for. That's a that's a really really good. I mean, it's in in their it's in their hit style. It it really is fantastic. Yeah, I always love when they did. I saw mommy kissing Santa Claus. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes, I like that version yes. of that. So yeah, me too. I like the chip. All right, Christmas. this. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, and chipmunks sing the Beatles. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh-huh. I can't listen to that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I really, I really can't. I do have a memory though of um, going down in downtown Boston uh, when I was a kid. The um, uh, for anybody in in the in the Boston area, um, Feline's, uh, uh department store used to have a window, and they used to do the chipmunk song. And I th- that has stayed with me forever. I mean, that'll never that'll never leave. So, there. <laughs> the chipmunk song. The chipmunk song is timeless. Remember it, that. It is. It is. <laughs> we so. have way too much time on our hands. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it about time to wrap this up? Yeah. Speaking of time. <laughs> All right, so if any of you would like to get in touch with us, we have an email address, which is things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. We also have our own Facebook page. Steve loves to talk about our Twitter page, don't you, Steve? Yes, things we said fab is our Twitter. Okay, address. if any of you would like to get in touch with Alan, they could do so. How, Alan? Oh, probably go on Facebook and find me either under Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Okay, and how about you, Al? Uh, Facebook, uh, Al Sussman. Uh, Twitter, uh, at A-S-U-S-S-4-9. Uh, or through uh, www.beetlefan.com or www.paradingpress.com for Changing Times, 101 Days to Shape the Generation, in case you need a last-minute gift. For, for somebody who's uh, very history-minded. That's true. Alan, why don't you tell the folks the book that you always uh, you know, want them to know about as far as... Well, actually, there's two. Yeah. There's two that they should pick there's up. There's The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, which is sort of a general overall history and is physically in print. Mm-hmm. And there is Got That Something, How the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything, which is an ebook. I think you can still get through Amazon. Okay, Steve, how about you? Um, you can get me uh, by writing to BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. Um, I am also, also the author of a semi Beatles related book called Meet a Monkey Davy Jones, in which I talk about my two interviews with Davy Jones, and he talks about the Beatles and being uh, appearing on the first Ed Sullivan show in one of them in one of the interviews and um, you can also get a hold of the show through Facebook and we've gotten some comments on Facebook recently um, that we are pondering I'm not going to say what they are but we, we we have we appreciate your comments and please feel free to write to us okay and as for me Ken Michaels uh, you can write to my direct email address which is Every little thing at att.net. Also visit my website, kenmichaelsradio.com. There's Beatles trivia every single week. Win your choice of one of nine prizes, including the new Beatles 1 CD and DVD I'm giving away now uh, on my website. Uh, that's the, the CD plus the first disc, not the deluxe version. But it is a great present, you know, to get for the holidays or to give someone for the holidays. The Beatles 1 CD and DVD. And um, I have my own Facebook page, which is Ken Michaels. Easy to remember, right there. All right, so 
for Steve Marinucci, Al Sussman, and Alan Kozen. This has been fun. Thanks so much for listening to Things We Said Today, and we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.